Okay, we're going to get right into this because I want to be sensitive to the fact that uh, moms and dads, you have some little ones with you. And uh, so we want to get going here. And uh, hopefully this will even be a little bit shorter than normal, uh, which I'm sure will break your hearts. So uh, I also want it to be just as practical as possible. I'm going to put a quote up here. I've heard it from Dave Stone and uh, Andy Stanley and... Um, Francis Chan. I mean, it's, it's one that you've probably heard from some sources as well. And I may not get it exactly as we're going to put it on the screen, but it goes something like this. The sum, or, or excuse me, our life is the sum total of, of the decisions that we make. We are who we are basically because of the decisions that we have made through the years. We are the people that we are because of the decisions that we've made. Now, we tend to like to blame things. We like to blame other people. You know, my dad was aloof. My mom was an alcoholic. My brothers and sisters didn't treat me right. And I was whatever, and on and on and on it went. And you can't control any of those things, but you can control how you respond to them. And so it's still true. You're the one that makes the decision. Something bad happens, somebody mistreats you. How are you going to respond to that? will determine a destiny, your destiny. And as you come to follow Christ and surrender your life to Him, you begin to understand that your life is no longer your own. It belongs to Him. You've just given it to Him. So what becomes urgent in your mind is how can I discover what God wants from me? As I go through life making daily decisions, how do I know what God's will is for me? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about making those decisions, going vertical when you need to make a decision in your life, whether it's a daily decision or whether it's a monumental decision um, that carries a lot of importance, a lot of weight to it. It makes no difference. These same principles can apply. And the question is, in the back of our minds, how can we find out what God wants from us? from day to day, and in these larger decisions as well. And as a background scripture, we're going to go to uh, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. You could probably quote it as we read it. He says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways submit to Him, and He will make your paths straight. Just hold that, if you will, in your mind and in your Bibles, because we're going to go back to it at the end of the message. That is a background text. And whenever you're making a decision, whenever you're saying to God, God, I want to know what your will is for me in this situation or that situation, please refer back to Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. And take time uh, to read it through and to pray about it and consider how it might apply in any particular Situation. Now, we're going to talk about God's will here, and uh, I've gleaned this information from a lot of different places. I'm actually uh, uh, took an introduction to an old sermon and made a whole sermon out of it. So, here we go. There are three basic thoughts concerning God's will that we find in the Bible. Three different uses of the term God's will found in the Bible. And we're going to go through those and uh, unpack them here just for a little bit. The first is His providential will. The providential will of God are those things that God is going to do or has done no matter what. No matter how many people prayed, no matter how many people he used to, to uh, bring on board to get those things done, those things that are the providential will of God are things that God will do no matter what. And we see lots of examples uh, in the Bible. Let's look at Galatians 4, verses 4 through 5. Paul is writing and he says, when, But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. And then in John 14, it, 
It tells us, don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you. And I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare that place for you, I will come again. What are the examples of the providential laws in those two texts? Number one, God was and did bring his son into the world. That was his plan from the beginning. The Bible tells us before the foundations of the earth were laid, God knew exactly what he was going to do. And the New Testament, or excuse me, the Old Testament is filled with prophecies concerning what God was going to do to bring his son into the world, to bless the world, and to redeem mankind. That's what Galatians 4.4 4 is all about. When the time was right, God did exactly what he promised he was going to do. That was going to happen no matter what. The second example in John 14 is that Jesus will return. There will come a time when he will look at Jesus and give him the nod and there will be a mighty shout, the trumpet will sound, the skies will split open and every eye will see, every tongue will confess, everybody will bow to his lordship. There is a time when Jesus will come again. That's his providential, wall, uh, providential will. There's nothing that you can do to block that. There's nothing you can do to change that. It's going to happen no matter what. Isn't that a good thing? Hear any amens out there? Amen. Yeah, thank you. God's providential will is so important. And some of the exciting news here is that He uses people to bring about His providential will. When He wanted to bring Jesus into the world, who did He use? Mary said, Mary, by the way, <laughs> uh, I've chosen you above all others uh, so that you will have my son. He used Mary when uh, he wanted to create a people for himself. We call the nation of Israel. Who did he use? Well, he came to Abraham and he said, Abraham, who lived in modern day Iraq, Abraham, I'm going to create a great people. Many of your descendants uh, will be on this planet, and I'm going to bless the rest of the world because of you and your faith. So I want you to pack up everything, and I want you to go to a land that I will show you, and there I will prosper you. When God wanted to raise up a nation to himself, we call him Israel, he chose Abraham. He said, Abraham, you're the guy. The providential will of God are those things that He's going to do no matter what. No matter how many people pray or how few people pray. And He uses people to accomplish His providential will. And here's an important point. The more we study and the more we understand God's providential will and what He's up to in this world, the easier it is for us to begin to understand what His will for us as individuals is in our lives. And we're going to revisit that here in just a little bit and try to show you a little bit of how that, how that works. So that's the first way that the Bible refers to God's will. It's the providential will of God the things that he's going to do, no matter what. They're set in stone. Nothing will change his mind. It's going to happen. Jesus is going to come again. Now, that's the best example. And there's not a thing anybody can do to avoid that or to change it. Number two, the second way that God's will is seen in the Bible or referred to in the Bible is his moral will. His moral will. His moral will is the standard of behavior for His people. Summed up, we see it in the Ten Commandments. You know, don't lie, don't steal, don't commit adultery, and on, on it goes. That is God's will for His people. A great text for this is found in 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter. The third verse. It is God's will that you should be sanctified. And that word sanctified simply means to be different. To be set aside from the rest of the world. We should be very 
Well, Paul refers to us as a peculiar people. We should be a little bit odd out there because our values are different, our behaviors are different, our standards are different as we endeavor to live up to God's moral will. Why? That you should avoid sexual immorality. That's one of the things that God talks about. He's saying, you know what? You are to be sanctified, so moral... My moral will for you is that you abstain from sexual immorality. There are some decisions God is telling us in this moral realm that are already made for us, right? When we get right down to it. And this is one of them. This is just one example. So, if your fiancé says, you know what? Why don't you just move in because you don't buy a new car without taking it out for a spin. We don't buy a pair of shoes unless we try them on. So why don't you move in with me and we'll just try to give it a shot here for a while to see if we really want to get married. You don't have to get on your knees and pray that God will show you his will for that people. It's already very plain. It's already written in stone for us, if you will, to avoid sexual immorality. So there are some decisions that are already made for us. We don't have to worry uh, and stew uh, about what it is that God wants us to do. Does he want us to cheat at our income tax? No, you may be tempted. Or an expense report? No, you may be tempted. Does he want us to lie to our bosses? When he calls us to an account for some misbehavior? No, but we may be tempted. Those decisions are made for us. Uh, and uh, it's a part of God's moral will for our lives. And we don't have to hit our knees. We don't have to wonder. We don't have to struggle with that. The answers are very plain and very obvious. God's moral law, God's providential law. I can't talk this morning. God's providential law, God's moral law, sort of like guardrails on the road to help us understand God's personal will for our life. God's personal will for our life. The providential will of God, the more we understand it, the easier it is to discover God's will for us personally. The moral will of God, the better we understand it, the easier it is for us to discover God's will for us personally. God's personal will is what He calls you to do. Because God is interested in your life. Even the little details of your life. I love Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. And I hope uh, you'll highlight this and go back to it often. It says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus, to do good works, just randomly. Well, no, it may appear that way from our side, but these are good works, what does he say? Which God has prepared in advance for us to do. God is interested in your personal life. He's interested in your day-to-day -day decisions because He has a plan for you. He has it nailed down. He has things for you to do that nobody else will do if you don't do them. He has people that He wants you to share your faith with that maybe nobody else will share their faith with unless you pick that up. We are His handiwork. He is creating us. He is molding us. He is making us into His image in order to do some things that He has prepared in advance for us to do, all for His glory. That's His personal will. And there are all kinds of things related to that. What college should I go to? High school students wondering about that. What career should I pursue? Who should I marry? And if you're already married, should I take that job promotion that will move me across the country? Should we buy this house or this house? Should we buy that car or another car? All of that is related to God's personal will in your life. And uh, he's interested in all of those things. Those are difficult decisions to deal with. If you don't think God's interested in your personal life, just think of the Apostle Paul. 
and what he went through. In Acts chapter 26, he's talking about his own conversion to Christ when he surrendered, surrendered his life to Christ. And picking up with verse 18, he says, Then I ask, this is Jesus confronting him, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. Paul, I'm interested in you. I'm interested in your personal life. And here's my plan for you. You're going to be a witness of all that you have heard and seen of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them, referring to the Gentiles, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. That was God's personal will for Paul. He set him aside to be a missionary to the Jews first, he says, and then to the Gentiles. It came to him from the very beginning. Now, he didn't have all of the details. He ended up on three different missionary journeys. And if you read the book of Acts and you read through his accounts of his missionary journeys, you see that there were times when he wanted to go into a particular city and God stopped him and redirected him and he went over here instead. God's personal will can be very detailed in our lives. And that's where we get kind of nervous when we're trying to discover God's personal will for our lives. We can get, get kind of nervous. This job, that job, this person should I marry or not? You know, this college, another college, this house, that car, or, or maybe something else. We get a little uncomfortable with all of that. And those are the things that we sweat over, we wonder about, and we can uh, stay awake at night worrying over if we're not careful. So we have God's providential will, things that he's going to do no matter what. And he uses people, and you will be a part of that, by the way. God's moral will, his standard of behavior for his people, and God's personal will. His providential will, his moral will are like guardrails on the road. The more you understand them, the more you begin to understand God's personal will for your life. In fact, when God came to Paul and said, by the way, I'm going to send you to the Gentiles to be a witness of all that you have heard and all that you will see of me, he was using Paul to satisfy his providential will. That's how it worked. God was going to reach out to the Gentiles. Jesus was very plain about that. He says, you know what? I, God is going to call people from out of this flock, or out of the Jewish nation. That's the rest of us. And he used Paul to get that done. God's providential will is that he will call many, many, many people to him. And he wants to use you to get that done. So the question becomes, again, as we begin to grasp the fact that God's personal will for our lives can be very detailed, is how do I discover His will for my life as an individual? If I'm faced with some decisions to make, or a major decision, or even daily decisions, how do I discover what God's will is for my life? And, and here's where I would like for you to take notes because I'm going to give you not a formula, but some steps that I think you should take um, and make sure you take them, put them all together, and uh, it, it will make it easier for you to discover God's will. And by the way, because this is a little bit complicated, there is an outline, oops, excuse me, there are some outlines available here. You might want to pick one up uh, after the service. So let's take a look at it. Here are some things that you can do. Number one, know and understand the word. When you're faced with a decision, search it out. Get into it. And if you're a little confused about things, go talk to somebody and say, what does the Bible have to say about this? What does God have to say about this? What does the Word have to say about this? I love what David said in Proverbs 119, verse 24. He says, your statutes are my delight 
They are my counselors. I get into God's word, and if my fiance has invited me to move in with him or her, I automatically know as I search out his word that God's moral law would say, no, don't do that. That's trouble. That just makes things more difficult for you. It's a protection in our life. He becomes a counselor to us through his word. Does that make sense? That's what David is saying there. Number two, seek out counselors. One of the ways that God reveals his will to us is that he has given us each other as gifts. He's given us his word. He's given us each other. And in conversations, whether they are directed specifically at the decision that we're going to make or not, God can reveal to us, He can speak to us through one another. That's part of the function of the fellowship. I've been in situations before where uh, we've wondered a little bit of what to do and in a conversation with somebody not even related to the topic, suddenly I go, oh, that's, that's the answer. God speaks through other people. Solomon wrote much of the book of Proverbs. And Solomon, remember, was the wisest man who ever lived. God gave him, um, or granted him, I guess what you would call a wish. He said, I'll give you whatever you want. And God, or excuse me, Solomon asked for wisdom to rule his people. And it's interesting, as wise as Solomon was, the Proverbs are filled with advice to go ask for counsel when you're faced with the decision. Proverbs 12, 16, the way of fools seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. Proverbs 13, 10, where there is strife, there is pride, but wisdom is found in those who take advice. Proverbs 19.20, listen to advice and accept discipline, and at the end you will be counted among the wise. Find wise counsel when you need to make a decision, especially if you're in a hurry. Find wise counsel. The next question is, how in the world do we choose the people that we go talk to? Um, there's a temptation for us to talk to our peers. Uh, that's the way um, I started out. <laughs> um, I'd run into trouble. I'd call my friends uh, who were also in the ministry. And uh, they would say, well, you know, this is what I would do. I, this blah, 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 you know, it was, uh, wasn't always very good advice because he was as ignorant as I was. He didn't have any more life experience than I did or any more ministry experience than I did. And so were there times I made a situation worse because I followed somebody's advice. So here's number one. Principle number one. If you're going to choose somebody to go talk to and seek out wise counsel, find somebody who is where you want to be. Does that make sense? If you want a great marriage, go find somebody that has a great marriage. And sit down with them and talk to them about it. Don't find somebody who's going through the same problems that you are. You may feel better for a while, but there's no guarantee that their advice will be very wise and be very helpful at all because they're as ignorant as you are. Go find somebody who is where you want to be. If you want that great marriage, go find somebody who's got a great marriage. If you want to be better handling your finances, go find somebody who has proven themselves able to handle their finances and has found some sense of success in their life. If you want to learn how to share your faith effectively, go find somebody who's busy actively doing all of that. Choose somebody who's already where you want to be because they can lay it out for you. They can say, hey, here are the mistakes I made. Don't make those mistakes. Here's the road map. This is what I did. This is what you can do to advance your marriage, to advance your financial stability, to advance whatever it is that you're seeking wisdom for. And by the way, it's really important that you find number two, somebody who's biblically literate somewhere along the line. doesn't mean you can't talk to somebody else, uh, even an unbeliever. Sometimes God uses unbelievers 
to communicate to you. But find somebody who is biblically sound, biblically learned, who can tell you if you ask, what does the Bible say about this? So rule number one and two, choose somebody who's already where you want to be. Number two, find somebody who is biblically literate and can help answer that question. Well, by the way, what does God say about this? It's just common sense in a lot of ways. But the emotions stir up, you know, and you're busy in your office and a co-worker comes in and you're not in a good mood because things at home aren't very good and your marriage is falling apart. And he or she says, well, what's wrong? And you say, well, sit down, I'm going to tell you. And, you know, and so you exchange a lot of really not very wise stuff and you get a lot of stupid advice. Well, this is what I would do. And he's had three divorces already. Find somebody that can share wisdom. Not just that you can unload on and will absorb everything that you deliver to them. Seek out wise counsel and choose your counselors carefully. And you don't have to front load everything. This was pointed out to me this week as we were studying for this. You know, you don't have to call somebody, you know, and say, oh, by the way, I've got this decision making. I want to hear from the Lord. So can we meet for lunch? Uh, you don't have to do that. Just sit down and share with them. And you'll be surprised how clearly uh, God can speak through the wisdom of his people. Number three. Rattle some doorknobs. Check for opportunities. Look for opportunities. I hope I'm in order. Am I in order here? Okay, let's take a look at 1 Corinthians 16, 8 through 9. And here's where you're going to see the Apostle Paul uh, looking for open doors, looking for opportunity. He's writing uh, to the Corinthians, and he's in Ephesus, and he sends a letter to them. But he says, I'm, I want to come to you, but, verse 8, I will stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost, because a great door for effective work has opened to me. And there are many who oppose me. There was a lot of opposition to Paul in his ministry. But he says, you know what? Even though Ephesus is in an uproar, and if you read the account in the book of Acts, it was an uproar. There was a riot against Paul uh, in the city of Ephesus. He says, even though there are many who oppose me, I'm going to stay here because in the middle of all of that, God has opened some opportunities for me. He's opened some doors. So rattle some doorknobs and see if God opens doors. Look for opportunities and notice this here again Paul is using Paul or God is using Paul to fulfill his providential will of reaching the Gentiles with the gospel and we think of uh, I, I, I thought of the Philippian jailer when I was thinking about an example in the Apostle Paul's life he and Silas had been arrested for preaching, beaten. They were thrown in stocks in the innermost prison. And there at midnight, they were singing and praising God. And, and the Philippian jailer um, uh, was scared because there was an earthquake and the door to the cells were open and the chains fell off. And he knew he would be killed if these guys got away and escaped. And so he said, guys, it, he was ready to draw his sword. And Paul said, don't harm yourself. Don't harm yourself. We're all here. And the jailer took him into the home. You remember the story? And uh, they dressed, he dressed their wounds. They shared the gospel. And that night he surrendered his life to Christ along with his household. And they were all baptized into Christ. Open doors, literally open cell doors, open the door into the jailer's home. And God was using Paul to fulfill his providential will to take the gospel to the Gentiles. So look for open doors. I remember one time being in a store here in town and there was a, a man uh, who was an older man in town who was dying of cancer and everybody knew he was dying and he knew he was dying. And um, he was not a believer. And we were in a conversation, had nothing to do with anything. 
related to his illness when he said, you know, uh, I'm feeling pretty good. He just came out of the blue. You know, I'm feeling pretty good, but I can tell I'm getting weaker as the days go by. And um, I, I'm, I'm a little nervous about it. And I said, um, are, are, you, are you a little scared? And he says, yeah. He says, I just hope the good things that I've done outweigh the bad things that I've done. And it was the perfect opportunity. God opened the door for me to share the grace of God. Because I had an opportunity to say, you know what? It isn't about your good things outweighing the bad things. It's about the blood of Christ in your life washing away your sins grace look for opportunities whether it's choosing the school that you go to uh, job opportunities housing opportunities whatever it is look for open doors rattle some doorknobs next ask yourself what did I want What's your desire? I, I've noticed something in 48 years of ministry that um, oftentimes well, I think, no, not all the time, but most of the time, when God calls you to do something, He puts the desire in your heart. He motivates you to get that done. God called Paul to the Gentiles, and He motivated Paul. There were times in Paul's writings, he said, you know what, I would gladly die and be sent to hell for the sake of those who have yet to hear the gospel. He was motivated. He wanted to go to Rome and share the gospel with people in Rome, in particular the emperor. And eventually that happened. Um, and tradition tells us he lost his head because of it. But he motivated him. God motivated him. To, he worked in his heart and he gave him enthusiasm for that task. Psalm 37, 4. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. That doesn't mean if you come to church he's going to give you the new bass boat, guys. That's not what he's talking about. He's not saying God is just a big Santa Claus out there for his people. He's just going to give you whatever you want. He, the key word there is delight in the Lord. That means focus in on the Lord. Live for Him. Work at discovering His providential will and what He's up to in this world. Work at understanding His moral will. Work at understanding His personal will for you in your life. And he will develop motivation. So when all of this process, when you look at the word, when you seek wise counsel, when you do these other things, don't forget the motivations in your heart. What it is that you want to do. Because God will motivate you most likely to get his work done. He will change your heart and you will say, you know what, we really need to do this. Somebody needs to step up to the plate. Let's get and, and he will gift you, motivate you to get that done. So don't, don't exclude that. Ask yourself, what is it that I want to do? Next, pray. And I'm going to add like crazy. Pray like crazy. Bathe it all in prayer. Pray continually. Be on your knees. Wear calluses on your knees and all of this. And you don't need, it's no mystery what to pray for. Let's read James 1, verses 5 through 7. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown here and there and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from God. When you have a decision to make and you're saying to yourself, what is it, God? And you're saying to him, what is it, God, that you want me to do? Pray like crazy and pray for wisdom and then trust that God will give it. That doesn't mean you don't seek wise counsel. It doesn't mean that you don't search the word. It doesn't mean that you refuse to look at the motivations of your heart and see what God is moving you to do. It means all of those things come in a package. Do all of them. Put them all together. And if you're in a real hurry and you don't have time to do heavy Bible studies, I would recommend that you seek wise counsel from people who are biblically literate. Sit down with them and say, i got to make this decision the day after tomorrow. I need your input. I need to know what God says about this. Is there anything in the Bible that re relates to the decision that I'm trying to make? Yeah, what do you think? 
make sure that you do all of these things and trust God to give you wisdom. Pray for it and trust Him to give you wisdom. Last step. I'm moving through quick. Ooh, not as quickly as I thought. Sorry about that. <clears throat> Be ready to say yes. We're going to go back to Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. You know what? You don't see everything that God lays out for you and then act on that. You act first and then God reveals His will to you step by step. I love the illustrations, old Iowa illustration about a blizzard that had hit the state and you couldn't see across the street. And a young man was staying on his grandpa's farm. It was night. It was bitterly cold and they needed to get the livestock into the barn, the horses especially, into the barn. And uh, the, Grandpa couldn't go out there. He was bedfast. And so his grandson said, you know what, I'll go. But I can't see. I can't see anything. It's black out there. And so Grandpa said, you know what, I want you to light the lantern. I want you to step out on the back porch, hold up the lantern. And that's what the kid did. And Grandpa said, well, how far can you see? And he said, I can see to the back gate. He said, go to the back gate. You know where I'm going. The young man went. And he said, Grandpa, what now? And Grandpa yelled back, how far can you see? And he said, I can see to the garage. Grandpa said, go to the garage. He went to the garage. Grandpa, what now? Well, how far can you see? Well, I can see the barn doors. Well, then go to the barn doors and open them up. You see, it's step by step by step. When God called Abraham, he didn't reveal everything to him all at one time. He said, just pack up and go to a land that I will show you. That's the first step, Abraham. Don't expect God to reveal everything, but understand this. He won't reveal His will to you clearly, His personal will for you clearly, until you are at the point where you're willing to say yes no matter what. Because God, I have heard this this week and I loved it, God does not give you His will as a suggestion for your consideration. You know, and that's how we handle it sometimes. We say, God, I want to know what you want me to do because... I, I want to consider it. I want my options open. I think it was Andy Stanley that said that, and I really liked it. I want to keep my options open, and I'll, I'll take it into consideration. God's, God's will for your life isn't given to you for your consideration. It's given to you for obedience. And He's not going to give it to you until you arrive at the point where you say, God, here I am, send me. Whatever you call me to do, I'm saying yes. What holds us back from that? Fear. Right? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust. That's what God calls us to. Trust in the Lord. He says, trust me. I'm not going to show you the whole, whole journey, but do you trust me enough to take this step? Or are you afraid? You know, well, we're afraid maybe he's going to send us to Ecuador and we're going to live in a mud hut. For, and he might. But until you arrive at the point where he says, or you say, God, whatever you call me to, I'm saying yes. His will will always be a little fuzzy in your life. You'll always struggle over discovering his personal will in your life. Trust, with the, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Nothing held back. Lean not to your own understanding. Don't depend on your ability to figure out. In all your ways, there's that word again, submit to Him and He will make your paths straight. He will reveal it clearly to you. He will make it obvious to you. Whether it's through the fellowship, whether it's through the word, He will make it obvious to you. Because He wants to communicate it to you. He doesn't want to hold back and get you confused. Paul says God's not the author of confusion. He wants to make it clear. The question is, are you willing to say yes no matter what? 
even though you can't see the end result. Romans 12, 2, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Do you trust that God wants your best? Do you trust that He loves you so much He has nothing but your best interests at heart? If you do, are you ready to say yes to Him? God, whatever you call me to, if it's a mud hut in Ecuador, yes. If it's a new job in L.A., yes. God, whatever it is, the answer is yes. That's what Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 is all about. That's what it's all about. And the question is, is that what you're all about? Are you holding back? You're, you're not even praying fervently because you really don't want to hear what you think God might be telling you. You just kind of push it off to the side. Fear is taking over and you're not there. Will you say yes to Him no matter what? The praise team's going to come out and they're going to lead us in a final song. And uh, as they do, I want to ask you today, are you willing to say yes to Him? You may have been a Christian for 40 years or 40 days. We've had a whole bunch of people in, in the last month come to Christ. Um, 10 days, 4 days. Are you ready to say yes to Him no matter what? Are you going to let fear take over and hold back? And then live your life kind of stumbling through things, confused and awkward as you try to serve Him. And if you're here today and you're outside of Christ, He's calling you. And He's saying, you know what? Whosoever will may come. Will you surrender to me? Will you surrender to Him? That's the question I'm asking. Will you surrender to Him? Will you say yes to Him? No matter what. That's what He calls us to. That's the abundant life that He's talking about. And if you need to make that decision, I'll be down front. Nathan's here. You can find somebody who's older in the faith to talk to. But please don't walk out of these doors before you say yes to Him. Let's be standing together out of honoring Him, or because we're honoring Him, I'll pray and then they'll lead us in that final song and we'll be dismissed. Father in heaven, we thank you that you want to communicate and you do communicate your will to us. Father, help us to get serious about finding it, realizing that we are not our own, but we were bought with a price. Father, help us to work hard at discovering your personal will, to work hard at understanding your providential will, what you're up to in this world, and to work hard at understanding and living up to in obedience, your moral will. Father, help us to say yes to you no matter what. Please help us arrive at that point and overcome fear in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Shelter, I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen. 